from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number 45, recorded on May 17, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hi. Hey there. Great to be here. We're going to go through the email bag and looking forward to it. It's been a while since we've been through the email bag. And from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Welcome back. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Great to see you all. We're recording it within a week because <laughs> we haven't done email in a long time and we decided yeah. we felt we felt we should do that. So that's no, what I we kind of felt today. badly. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. but it, but now it's we're after my semester and after grading. So it feels like a whole new time. Do you feel like a whole new person? <laughs> For the whole hour or so I've been done grading, yes. <laughs> that's very good. Yay. Do you want to have like a, a little cocktail? A little, <laughs> you know, Maybe celebratory later. drink? Okay. Cocktail. There you go. <laughs> very good. Now, when do you teach again? In the fall? In the fall. I have students starting uh, doing research in my lab in two weeks, but no classes until the fall. That's great. Summer okay. students are always so much fun. They are. Yeah. Mm. I missed it last year because everything was closed down. Is it open for summer work yes, this year? Yes. I have yeah, an great. undergraduate and a DVM student that are both mm. going to be working in my lab this summer in person. So, yay. That's great. That's great. Now, Cindy, also update us on your son. He got yes. I was jabbering right vaccine? before we got on. So, my last, my youngest, just got his vaccine today. Pfizer was approved for twelve to sixteen year olds. Yay! And so he was he was the last one in our family. And so just a few more weeks, and then that's great. <sighs> Mom is bears, <laughs> relaxing a little. Yeah, he goes. My arm's a little sore within a couple <laughs> hours. I'm like. Oh, that might be a bit sore, more sore tomorrow. But yeah. did you okay. did you say? Let me tell you what's going on there in that arm. <laughs> well, <laughs> he, 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 I, I said just make sure you rub it and everything, so all your dendritic cells pick up all those antigens. He goes, oh, shut up. Yeah, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> shut I was gonna up. say like his age, he may not be you know <laughs> so into that right now. But it's really cute because they do pick up on stuff um, mm. because I'll hear them explaining things to their friends, and I'm like, oh, not quite right, but thank you for trying. <laughs> you trying? That's great. <laughs> yes. Educating the next generation of future immunologists. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's jump into email. Uh, I think, Cindy, you should probably take that first one, right? I, I hope I can make it through these words because this is really kind of funny, actually. Uh, very, very clever. Okay, so Scott writes, episode 43 about CarMax was magnific magnificent. I shared the episode with the journal club paper I presented during a macrophage therapy where interferon backpacks are loaded onto macrophages before delivery. Here's the link. I think it's open access, so you can go and look at that. Um, and he um, summarizes, these backpacked macs keep their anti-tumor M1 activation inside of tumors because the backpacked interferon provides localized a pro-M1 signal. In the, and we talked about M1 versus M2, and, and it's not exact, but tumor-associated macrophages are more M2-like because the tumor microenvironment co-opts them. And if you can try to maintain them in this more M1-like phenotype, they're more uh, phagocytic and, and pro-killing uh, towards tumor cells. And so he says, in the paper, the authors delivered interferon gamma backpacked max to a breast cancer metastasis mouse model and showed that the backpacking promoted tumor destruction and mouse survival. Additionally, interferon gamma carried on the macrophages helped promote more of an M1 phenotype in the endogenous tumor-associated macrophages. So suggesting that it's really um, priming those macrophages in the tumor as well. And so here's, I got to try this. In summary, they backpacked the max and the interferon gamma snack that sustained them on their tumor <laughs> track. <laughs> the max also shared the interferon gamma snack from their backpacks with this tumor max to put them on the attack. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> or with a backpack on the Mac, make the cell M1, this tumor will come undone. So it's very poetic. It's awesome. very good. <laughs> so thanks for sharing new immunology inside and outside of COVID-19. I look forward to the next episode, regardless of the topic. Maybe soon we'll hear the long-promised episode on bat immunology. Either way, I will be tuning into the next episode. Same bat time, same bat channel. 
Best Scott, Madison, Wisconsin. And That's I commented great. on there. I'm like, we should do the bat immunology paper that the sting paper is oh, so, that sting that paper it is, is great the coolest paper so we're putting it on the list thanks that for paper the is so Scott. cool pretty much everything i've ever learned about bad immunology is so cool <laughs> is that the one we did on twiv uh, we pre- did we okay. did uh, yes uh, well, nice. we can do a nice little slight different yeah, spin a little, on it yeah a little different spin and also i did i saw that and i put a little call out on my twitter because i know a lot of people who work with vi- from viruses from bats. Yes. And I know some people who work with bat immunology in the context of viral infection. I don't know a lot of just bat immunologists. So I put a little call out. We're going to see, you know, if we can gather up some more people. So we have maybe a pool of bat immunologists. We can have someone come on. Oh, that would be great if we can have somebody come on because I, I certainly only I would know what's in that paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> and kind of- I kind of have to take that on face value because I <laughs> certainly don't really know the bat immunology, but... Yeah, maybe they could come on. Uh, there was a couple of people suggested and talk about their career and then we could do that paper with them. Oh, that'd, that'd be, be fun. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Steph, you want to take the next one? Yeah, sure. And uh, just going back to that backpack paper, it's pretty cool. So yeah. seemingly that the interferon gamma would not release outside of this nanoparticle or s- small molecule backpack until it gets to the tumor. So pretty neat technology. You know, you just have to, uh, you know, I'm assuming that it's not activating before it gets to the the site of the tumor so that you don't have, because that's the problem with cytokine therapy in general is, you know, it does act upon many different cell types. So if you could target it to a specific spot. Yeah, this is cool. I had never heard of the backpack before. Not on a a cell. On the mice. mice. I was going to say, backpack mice. (laughs) Somebody's got to draw us a picture of a macrophage with a backpack and send it in. I I have no artistic talent whatsoever. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so the next email is, how do we think that's pronounced? Winia? Winia? Winia. It's probably Winia. Hi, immune team. I'm a PhD holding academic research scientist that have no training in immunology other than what I've learned through osmosis. I've often listened to your podcast two or three times over while doing my own research in biochemistry just to catch every tidbit in addition to all the other this week in dot, dot, dot relatives. I have a few questions to, for your fabulous team. In an episode of the John Hopkins Public Health On Call podcast, it's number 168, Dr. Joshua Sharfstein speaks with Dr. Robert Brodsky discussing a research publication in the journal Blood. <clears throat> they speak at length about SARS-CoV-2 interacting with heparin sulfate at the cell surface and activating the complement immune system leading to the more nefarious thrombotic events seen in COVID-19 disease. Can you, um, or just COVID probably, it's a little redundant, right? COVID disease. Can you speak about the complement arm in the immune system more? Previous to this podcast, I had only heard of the innate and adaptive immune systems. Um, I will read number two and maybe Cindy will take that. Somebody who's not me because compliment, I don't know. I mean, I could go through it, but it's my least favorite. <laughs> it's whatever. <laughs> Roll my eyes. Um, in September, Derek Lowe's Science Magazine blog in the pipeline discussed a potential grand unifying hypothesis for SARS-CoV-2 effects centering around the brady kynan hypothesis. And I do remember this. Uh, they post the original paper and then the commentary. There he discusses a brady kynan storm at the be, uh, as being the root of severe complications we see in this disease, as opposed to the cytokine storm. Can you discuss this possibility? Are there other diseases in which the Brady kinin storm has been observed? And are there other diseases that go off of the cytokine pathway to create small molecule or peptide storms that yield severe complications? So we can talk about that in a little bit, but um, does anybody want to tackle the compliment question? Well, I, I wanted to make a little note in that in, in Immune 7, we did talk about compliment <clears throat> and I did, did give kind of a nice overview of the general um, aspects of compliment. It's really complicated. I always like to make that joke, <laughs> but it really is. There's like 30 different proteins and the regulatory proteins are absolutely critical because mm-hmm. um, without the regulatory proteins, it unleashes an inflammatory response. But um so it's it's interesting what role complement plays in antiviral immune response. It it has a few things. You can um, what we call fix complement or covalently cross-link the C3 molecule onto the surface of um, enveloped viruses. So it, that can help clear them or mark them for phagocytosis. Um, so that's one way. Um, potentially I've heard that the MAC attack complex, which is a pore forming complex that is an end product of the activation of the full complement cascade can, can poke holes in viruses. I I don't know what 
role that plays in anything. Um, but then there's also um, a couple of other ways. So infected cells that have viral proteins on the surface can have antibodies that are specific to those viral proteins. For example, a spike protein, right? Um, bound to the surface of the cell and that could actually fix complement on infected cells and lyse them. So there are multiple ways in which complement can um, act in an antiviral response. But yeah, it's it's interesting because complement is around all the time. It's sort of that preset molecule that as soon as something foreign comes in, you can it can get attacked by these proteins that are floating around extracellularly and in the blood. Yeah. So in order to answer the specific question here about the yeah. innate versus the adaptive immune system, um, complement is usually thought of as being one of the parts of the innate immune system. Um, in, in the in very big picture general terms. Um, but one thing that I think is interesting in the way you have your question set up here is that um, you, you've mentioned a little bit about coagulation and the theory mm -hmm. with blood clots, and then you mentioned complement. And yeah. in one thing to note is that both kind of the proteins involved in the blood clotting cascade and the complement cascade have some similarities in that they are these proteins that are secreted from cells that act in a cascade. You know, one acts on another, acts on another, acts on another, mm -hmm. generally by cleaving each other in order to have some sort of downstream physiologic effect. Um, and I think I don't remember all of the history of complement. Um, I, like Steph, will say that it's maybe not my favorite, although I've been told that my students like the lecture. I think because I, my lecture on it, I think because I tried really hard to make it interesting, mm -hmm. the things that I thought were intrinsically interesting, I was just like, of course this is interesting. Why try? Um, <laughs> and and complement I really worked on. Um, but I think that it's, that in fact, some of the parts of the discovery of complement may be linked to some of the discovery of the blood clotting proteins. And there are a number of ways that those systems can be interlinked. Yeah. And I've been more interested in complement recently because of their interaction, as Cindy mentioned, with antibodies in the FC, the, the fixing of um, antibody and complement because, so we have four different subclasses of IgG. So there's mm -hmm. IgG one through four, and they're all differentially glycosylated. So they all have these different sugars on their FC region, and they have different effects on their ability to activate things like complement. And so recently I've been more interested in complement. And it is one of those things as an immunologist, when you, when you take like your first immunology class, you just, you have to memorize all the complement proteins. And so I was going back and kind of reading through some of that, but it is, it is very relevant because as Brian mentioned, you, it's, it's the continuous cleaving of all these different proteins, this downstream signaling mechanism that has multiple different functions across multiple different cells. So um, very important. And speaking of you know, pathways that have multiple proteins that are cleaved, it does bring us to this next question where um, the writer asks about this Brady-Kynan hypothesis. And what's really interesting, and I'm curious what you guys think too, this hypothesis was presented, I think, in August of last year, August, September. No, they say in September. And then I never really heard about it again. Um, and I don't know if it's because they did anti-Brady-Kynan drug therapies and didn't show much. Yeah. Um, Brady Kynan is, so, so there's the renin angiotensin system. So angiotensinogen is cleaved into angiotensin one and two, and it interacts with ACE um, to promote angiogenesis and the formation of blood vessels. But then there's this thing, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, the calicrine kind of? Calicrine. 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 Calicrine, okay, kinin system. Um, there are so many words in immunology that I say in my head and then I hear a talk and it's like totally what different than <laughs> what I think it really is. Um, but that they are both, so both of these systems are using ACE, this enzyme, right. um, but the calicrine kinin system, it's Brady kinin breaking into these BK1, or BKB1 and B2 receptor, receptor interactions to... Um, again, upregulate angiogenesis. So um, the suggestion in patients that you saw an increase in bradykinin, I think just goes in line with you saw an increase in multiple different things that were released from damaged tissue. Yes. M maybe not necessarily that bradykinin was special. It's just you actually have an increase in many different factors. And I I struggle to see the, the relationship between that and ACE2 because as we know, mm -hmm. ACE and ACE2 are not the same. Right. 
Um, so I haven't heard much about Brady Kynan, but it actually really seeped into kind of popular media. And co- I had a lot of people asking me like, oh, is this it? it you know, the Brady Kynan hypothesis. I'm like, I don't really think, I don't really think so. I think there's just damaged tissue, right? Releasing components. I don't know what y'all think. Yeah, made a big splash, I, right? But mm-hmm. yeah. I agree. I, I haven't seen any follow-up. I mean, we're, we have to get to do some research and see if it's right. Because that was a hypothesis that this person generated, and that's fine. But yeah, yeah, that, yeah. nothing at all. No, nothing. No. no. So I mean, I think, think it's nice when people kind of try to connect those things together in an in intellectual way and put out there a potential model that people can then test. Definitely. And I think so. that does happen quite a bit in science. And and like you said, it, it kind of helps move things forward. But the, I think the problem with the pandemic is people putting out like these kind of more hypothesis driving op-eds or commentaries. And then, but there was actually an e-life paper associated with this. Um, so yeah, we'll have to see future research. Yeah. If people can keep it funded, right? <laughs> keep it coming. Right. I, I certainly don't, feel like I know enough about Brady Kynan to even have an opinion on this. Um, <laughs> I, I was kind of thinking the same thing. <laughs> but but one thing that I can say is, again, it's one of these sort of protein cascades where you have a number of proteins acting on one another. And one thing that I think maybe I'd been aware of in the literature, but I've become more aware of during this pandemic in terms of its importance, is the relationship between some of the innate immune cells and blood clotting. Yes. Um, and, you know, I hadn't thought a lot about that. And now I'm realizing that there is that that real link. And so could there be some kind of link here with some of those same kind of cells that are making a cytokine storm and influencing bradykinin? Maybe. Maybe yeah. someone should look. I don't know enough about it to there's say definitely, more than that. Yeah, there's definitely connections between the complement cascade and the thrombotic cascade. Right. Because those proteases that can cleave one can also cleave some from the other cascade. And so you can have this crosstalk. Um, the whole connection with Brady Kynan, I don't know. And, but and so, what you okay. say, oh, I was going to say, what you say about the um, the coagulation and the immune cells is really interesting because if we step back and look at comparative all the way back to insects and plants, they use these kinds of cascades to wall off infections. That was like the original innate immune system, right? Um, And so things have evolved from that, but that whole idea of clotting and of like walling off or making some sort of, you know, fibrosis around something is based in the ability of hemocytes and so forth to to make these melanin-like uh, blockades around infections. In, in- yeah, and there, it really shouldn't be that much of a surprise. I mean, if you really step back for a second and think about it, the idea that some part of the immune response would be involved in healing the wound should not be a surprise. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I think the, this person's name actually was Sarah. Her last oh. name's Winnia Smith. So just- Oh yeah, there you Sarah, go. Sarah, my mistake. Oh no, it's fine. No or Sarah, there you go. That would be a cool first name, Winnie. I know. I'm kind of like into that now. <laughs> I, it reminded me of Winona Ryder, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Sophia writes, hello, immune team. It was great to see all of your faces on Zoom, finally, so I could connect the voices to the people. I had imagined you smiling and wasn't wrong. Here's a nice article I found that you can talk about sometime in 2022 when COVID is over about sleep in the immune system. Mm-hmm. My question is if sleep is so important and nobody knows about it, or do they just ignore it, then shouldn't medical staff's working schedules be changed to something that amounts to more sleep for them? 36 hour working days per 100 hour working week or 100 hour working weeks, why are they a good idea in the first place? Shouldn't this be a law under the health and safety umbrella? My guess is if these scientists are right, then there is no wonder why medical staff showed higher rates death rates during the pandemic. They didn't sleep. Um, And she gives a link to a National Geographic article. Um, Thanks again and stay safe, Sophia. Vincent, what do you think about this? Uh, I couldn't get to this. It's got a paywall, but um, Uh, yeah, sleep. I mean, you you know sleep is important for uh, good immune responses, right? But exactly- why and how and how much you need it probably varies per person i mean it's not a scientific thing that's why and, and you know they have 
at least in the U.S., they've tried to give pe- give medical people more time off, right? The residents, their interns mm-hmm. used to stay up 36 hours in a row, but I think you can't do that anymore. But uh, I think it would be nice if we didn't have to sleep. We could get more done. <laughs> True. Yes, I, true. And I, I, yes, so I think people do know. Um, they, they just either, right, ignore it. I, I know I joke every time I see a new sleep article come out about the, the, the effects, how good it is. I'm like, I know, I get it, you know, beating over the head <laughs> with it. I got it. Um, but it, I, so I do think it has motivated, like Vincent said, them to re, to not have 36 hours straight working days. Um, and probably, yeah, the pandemic. I mean, there was a shortage of staff. Mm-hmm. people getting sick. So I'm sure it affected things negatively. Yeah. I think there are lots of things that relate sleep and um, the immune system with the circadian clock. Yeah. Um, but I think there's you know plenty more that we could figure out. And this is one place where looking at say a mouse model could be a bit, a bit tricky given that mice have different circadian clocks than people. Mm-hmm. They do. You can either switch them to your clock. Um, they do that. Yeah. So basically right. the room is dark right. when you're working, <laughs> right? So they reverse their circadian clock so that you can do the studies during when it's convenient for you. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. with those red lights that are very yeah. hard to see under. It, it is. It's really hard. But that's, yeah. that's one way to do it. I, I, that's what we do. They have the lights on during the day where people have to work with the mice. And then at 5 p.m., that's it. If you want to go to the mouse house at 5 p.m. or later, you better bring a flashlight. <laughs> You wear you wear a helmet with a little yeah. you know, light on top <laughs> while you work. That's yep. what we did. <laughs> yep, that's a that's a good question though. Yeah. All right, Mark writes, dear masters of the immuniverse. Thank you for continuing these very valuable podcasts, even though I still don't understand immunology. Since the days of my first undergraduate course decades ago, my current level of not understanding is far less terrifying and much more enjoyable. I have a brother who's a vibrant 78 and living in Burnett, Texas, not that far by Texas standards from Buda. He lives alone, and when he shops for groceries, he drives his truck that has only one bumper sticker, the small bat bumper sticker ubiquitous among cavers. He's been caving since he was in high school, mostly in Mexico and Texas, but hasn't gone underground for several years, although he is still active in the caving community. I went caving with him only once, but I have seen thousands of his photos from extended underground trips and listened to stories of the groups wading through waist-deep bat guano, swimming in underground lakes and rivers, and camping for days underground. I imagine they have been exposed to some nasty things. I wish you should use the word uh, spelunking because caving yes. sounds like you're giving in to something. <laughs> I, know, I, love, I love the word spelunking. That's great. <laughs> After listening to your podcast, it occurred to me that these hardcore active caving enthusiasts ranging in age from teens to the seventh decade might have antibody and adaptive immune cell profiles worth studying mm-hmm. as they have annual gatherings during non-pandemic years. They could perhaps donate the appropriate body substances prior to the drinking and tail telling. <laughs> Would something like this even be possible and useful? Many of these cavers live in or near Austin, and perhaps Rich Condit could suggest how this could be arranged. It's not a bad idea, but... Yeah. I mean, somebody who's active on faculty who could get an IRB approved yeah. to you know, start a study, um, studying the antibodies of splunkers and compare them to non-splunking people. It's a study I remember that Lin Fo Wong mentioned on on a Twiv. They after SARS one, they collected sera from farmers in the countryside in China, and, and they looked for uh, some a- antibodies that would bind the nuclear protein of SARS SARS like coronaviruses from bats, broadly reactive uh, at ELISA. And he said two or three percent of the People in the fields had antibodies to these viruses. We don't know which viruses, but they, they apparently are infected, and none of them remember getting sick. So you can find seropositivity. You have to just design an assay. So here in Austin, you'd have to you know, design an assay that would react with proteins from local bat viruses, but we don't even right. know what they are because nobody yeah, surveys. Say- True. Yeah, that was what I was going to say. It was, I think we talked to Tony Shouts at one point, and he said yeah. there was not much known about the North American bat virome. Yeah. So, wow. Wow. But wouldn't, wouldn't that be neat to see, though? I mean, because we assume that the that guano has 
coronavirus is in it, we could assume. So yeah. likely they'd be, some would be positive. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. I think it's worth doing, but I don't yeah. know of anyone who's done it. All right. Continuing on another topic in Immune 35, you mentioned a paper, the literature review with one of the co-author institutions here in Bangkok called AFRIMS, Armed Forces Research Institute of Medical Sciences. AFRIMS operates under RARE, <laughs> W-R-A-I-R. Walter Reed, right? What, oh. what is that? Walter, Walter Reed. Walter Reed, Army Institute of, of Research. Research. Hmm. I think. I thought there was an M in there, Institute of Medical Research. I don't know. I'll look it up. Look it up. And reading. has been here for I more than 60 wrong. years. The U.S. CDC also has a branch here. I brought up a question read in a previous episode about factors in Thailand that might have resulted in the very low per million population mortality ratio and seeming higher tolerance to SARS-CoV-2 infections. And among those factors could be lifetime exposure to enteroviruses, coronaviruses, dengue, and other bad stuff. Thai compliance with mask wearing and physical distancing has probably played a major role in keeping hospitalizations and reported cases down to about, well, he cites 3,500 total in a country of 69 million and 58 deaths. It's now 100,000 total cases and 589 deaths. Oof. I know some studies are being done here, but my sense is that far more research could be done given we have such a large advanced hospital system in places like AFRIMS. Perhaps one of your group or some colleagues could propose some immunological studies here that could be funded and take full advantage of the resources and population. Just a thought. Thanks for your efforts. Stay well, Mark. I think there are a number of countries where the, the rate has been very low. And we don't understand why. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, three months ago, people were saying, why is it, why are the case numbers in India so low, right? Mm -hmm. And, well, that was just oh. wrong. <laughs> yeah, they just hadn't quite gotten there yet and taken off. So I don't know about Thailand. Yeah, Thailand has done reasonably well, I guess. 100,000 cases um, overall. I mean, most of them are recently yeah. in the last uh, couple of months. So uh, we don't know these answer, the answers to these, not at all. Yeah, I... I would ha I wouldn't expect it to be cross reactive antibodies to other coronaviruses yeah. because of how limited SARS one was and MERS isn't there. But you know, the, I think social plays a lot, culture, um, and then there's more to be learned. I know that there are people throwing you know th hypotheses out there about health and diet and. Um, uh, previous exposure, I guess, to other vaccinations. Remember we had talked about... Um, the trained immunity. The trained story. immunity, yeah. So I, you're right. I think a lot a lot of potential studies. It just depends on, you know, who can get the funding and I guess would have collaborators that would, at that institute. And, and you all were right. It was Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks, Mark. Cindy, take the next one. Hey, Adam writes, hi, immune crew. I am a regular listener, but this is my first time writing in. Among other subjects, I teach immunology to undergrads at Albright College located in Reading, Pennsylvania. It's my favorite subject to teach with virology being a close second. I like listening to immune to keep me updated on recent developments in the field and stay informed of areas of immunology that I wouldn't normally be exposed to. You all do an excellent job. After coming to Albright, I shifted my research program to in vitro studies of host virus interactions. I use Ectromelia virus, or mouse pox, as a model. It is safe for undergrads to work with and produces many host modulatory gene products. However, my PhD thesis work was quite a bit different. I worked under the amazing direction of Mike Betts at the University of Pennsylvania. My primary project focused on the study of HIV-specific CD8 T cell responses from elite controllers versus normal progressors. I would collect and re-stimulate human PBMCs with peptides all the time. So I did many intracellular cytokine staining assays that I started to dream about flow cytometry at night. That's a sign of a true immunologist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, I listen with great interest to your most recent discussion of the study titled Selective and Cross-Reactive SARS-CoV-2 T-cell Epitopes in Unexposed Humans. You brought up many interesting points and critiques of the study. One particular aspect that you kept coming back to is the 14-day incubation period following peptide stimulation and trying to differentiate between naive and memory responses. I agree this could be hard to tease out. 
I'm wondering if memory T cells are selectively expanded in this culture system simply because they are already antigen experienced and no longer require co-stimulation to proliferate. As you know, a naive T cell requires both antigen, signal one, and co-stimulation, signal two, to start dividing and differentiating. These signals are typically delivered by dendritic cells in a lymph node. I'm wondering if naive T cells can even be relatively, or can even really be activated in the system used by the study authors whereby T cells were stimulated ex vivo by exogenous peptide. In such a system, there should not be an inflammatory stimulus, example, PAMP detection, to turn on expression of co stim molecules such as CD80 or CD86 on antigen-presenting cells in the culture. Could this explain why the expanded T cells were most likely an amnestic re memory response and not a recently activated naive T cell? I'm not sure. In my grad work, I only ever stimulated for six hours before staining for cytokine production. Therefore, I was only ever detecting effector memory T cells. This is my line of thinking and would love to hear your feedback to see if this is a plausible explanation. Thank you again for the time you put into doing immune. Cheers, Adam. I don't know, um, Brianne, what do you think? I think that was maybe we weren't articulating it quite as eloquently yes, I, as he did, but I think that was kind of the point we were trying to make, right? Yeah, I think that that's exactly the point we were trying to make, um, that you won't be able to uh, re-stimulate a naive cell given those culture conditions because you aren't giving co-stimulation. Um, and when I did similar experiments in grad school, in fact, many things that he talks about doing here experimentally are giving me flashbacks to grad school here. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, we would do something similar when we wanted to look at effector or memory T cells. And if we specifically wanted to look at naive T cells, we would also use an anti-CD28 antibody mm -hmm. um, to provide that second signal. Um, so yes, in this sort of system, um, you're exactly right. You can't get um, the naive cells to get activated because you don't have that second signal. Um, and Adam, your research with the undergrad sounds cool. I yeah. might email you. It's <laughs> nice. great. Steph. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Jacob writes, good morning, immune podfessers. That's cute. I like that. Thank you again for these awesome podcasts. You make the world of immunology accessible to mortals. This is not a trivial achievement. I have tried in the past to get a grasp on the subject only to be beaten back by the crazy nomenclature. Since I started listening, I, I have started jumping over the barriers that the subject has placed in front of me. Thanks for the leg up. I just finished listening to the episode four on CAR T-cell therapy. Can you do an update? Maybe this is what motivated us to do the update. I think maybe it was. It, it might have been. been. Uh, perhaps you could talk about oncolytic viral therapy. The idea of infecting a tumor with a virus to destroy, destroy the tumor is super cool. When I heard about using a polio virus to infect a brain tumor, I was just flabbergasted. Thank you for giving my idea consideration. So yes, we did do that on episode number, what did we say that was? 12? Uh, I'm sorry, 40? Uh, this is 44. This is 45. So this would have been like 43, I think. Uh, ish. Well, How somebody look it up? Yeah. So that was that was the update for car T cell mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oncolytic virus therapy is so cool. Oh, it is oh, so yeah. cool. Um, and and like I remember <clears throat> when Zika virus emerged, and they were trying to use Zika virus to deliver. Um, so I I think for oncolytic viral therapy, there's a couple different possibilities. They could, you could have the virus express stimulatory genes that would help to promote. T cell migration or overcoming T cell exhaustion. You can have the virus um, encode an antigen that would allow for expression near cells that would enhance killing. And then you could just have it directly kill a tumor infected or tumor cells, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or you could put a drug convertase in mm -hmm. and like TK, for example, and then give the patient a drug and then only the tumor cells will convert it to the toxic form, yeah. But, yeah. you know, the realization is that killing is just getting things started. You're actually waking up the immune system by killing the tumor cells and let the immune system do the rest because it's the hard rest. to target all mm -hmm. the cells, right? Really hard to do. Yeah, yes. Good stuff. And I don't know where we are at. Do we have current approved yeah. there, there, um There's one for melanoma, mm -hmm. uh, herpes virus, uh, is, is there like a 
glioblastoma one mm-hmm. or is that not approved yet? I'm not sure that is. No. What else is there? There are others, but I'm not. Th- I'm not remembering them. There, there's some in China that we don't have here. For there are adenoviruses for head and neck tumors in China, um, but lots in in trials though. Very yeah, exciting sure. field. Yeah, definitely. And and you've reviewed it in your your lectures. I have a lecture in my course on on therapeutic viruses. Yeah, which it covers in part oncolytic therapy. Yeah, uh-huh. I, I first learned about it on TWIV. Uh-huh. Um, when I was l- just listening to TWIV. So um, yeah. there are a few TWIV episodes too where it yeah. comes up. We had a guy. So one of the first companies, uh, what is it called? Uh, I think it was Oncolytics, Oncolytic Therapy or something. Anyway, the first virus used uh, in humans was a Rio virus. And we had mm-hmm. the CEO years ago on TWIV talking about that. But, so maybe uh, Google Vincent Racaniello and Oncolytic <laughs> Viral therapy and see what <laughs> pops up. You can find some things. Yeah, the twiv. There are some twivs though. It's it's. Uh, but um, worth having revisiting though. That's a very exciting field for sure. Yeah, yeah, we could yeah. do an episode. Brienne, sure. Shrag writes, "Hi, immune gang. Before I start, just wanted to do a quick and huge thank you for everything that you have been doing in terms." on creating a medium where scientific inquiry and discussion are the basis for all discussions pre and during the pandemic. The Microbe TV empire is a true gem and a cornerstone in scientific discussion. My name is Shirag and I am a grad student at Northwell's Feinstein Institute for Medical Research on Long Island, where it is a sunny 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of my projects in the lab center around B cell functionality in autoimmune diseases. Something that Brianne said in Immune 34 during the question section really sparked my interest. She was talking about how immunity induced by an infection may be different or not as robust as immunity induced by a vaccine. I did a little digging and came across this cell preproof, and he gives a link. Uh, basically, this paper is saying that the virus could potentially prevent a specific durable antibody response due to the lack of terminal centers. Terminal centers are something we are interested in in the lab. So I'm now doing a journal club paper presentation on this in a few weeks and looking forward to it. My question is, do we know if other coronaviruses cause a similar immune or lack of immune response, or is this SARS-CoV-2 specific? This paper is indicating a reduction in T follicular helper cells. Do we see that in other coronaviruses as well? It would make sense since common coronaviruses can reinfect individuals, indicating an eventual waning of antibodies. This pandemic has been a real catch-22 for me, as I am furiously reading and enjoying all the immunology papers that are coming out about the virus and disease, however, immediately feel guilty as I see so many people dying and suffering due to the medical and economic effects of this pandemic. I'd like to thank you guys again for keeping both the science and the human aspects of this pandemic prevalent in your discussions, and I look forward to listening to future episodes of the Microbe TV-verse. Um, and so Shirag sends a link to a paper, um, which Did, is the right? paper that, yes, the paper that uh, I know we've talked about. And in fact, I I can't say for sure because I don't exactly remember what comment I was making, but my guess is I was probably referencing this very paper <laughs> um, about the uh, loss of germinal centers uh, in COVID-19. And we, do um, that, uh, we did that on immune, We right? did this we paper. Did. I yeah. think that the one catch is that they looked at severe disease, right? Mm-hmm. These were patients who they died. succumbed to the disease. And so, in it, at least in those cases, the T follicular helper cells were deficient and you weren't getting the germinal center formation, which would suggest that the vaccines are much better because they will induce this response but we have to, you know, we have to always keep that caveat in our mind that the the people who haven't died from this may and likely did generate immune responses. We don't know comparatively how protective they are versus natural infection. Yeah, exactly. And when I first uh, looked at this paper, I wondered the exact same question about how this might compare to sort of the seasonal coronaviruses and mm-hmm. reinfection. Um, one trick as Cindy mentions, is that this paper was done in patients with severe um, COVID. In fact, uh, some of the figures include some really lovely images um, from lymph nodes um, 
of those germinal centers. And that was only possible because they were getting those germinal centers from patients who had died. Um, right. And so it would be hard to do a similar study looking at uh, individuals with the endemic coronaviruses. And we, I certainly don't think people have looked to answer uh, your question. Um, it would be hard to look, but I had the same question when I read this paper. So, Yeah, I think that this we don't have also... I don't know. I don't remember the age ranges of people that had died, but we could assume they were older. And we don't have younger controls of people who were also infected to say, is this an age deficient issue because the elderly are not developing germinal centers and that is why they succumb to the disease. So I don't, I, I don't think it's that specific to SARS-CoV-2. I think, um, it, I mean, I guess it could be, but I just, um, it's, it's likely due to a deficient immune system, not able to um, and d- provide protection, becoming exhausted, inflammatory, cascade is more what I would bet. I guess you can't rule it out though, right? Because viruses encode lots of proteins that interrupt many different aspects of the immune response. And so it's not inconceivable that they would encode something that would disrupt T follicular helper cell function. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how I read it was that there was something going on specifically, you know, maybe messing with the innate immune response to influence T follicular helper generation, but you're completely correct, Steph, that that is not at all, uh, you know, certain. And the only reason I say that is because if we think about the millions of individuals who had been infected and developed a robust antibody response, it would suggest that there's nothing specific about the virus that stops germinal centers from developing because they would not then have antibody responses. Well, so there, this paper and another paper that came out shortly thereafter kind of talked about the importance of extra follicular B cells mm-hmm. um, that are being formed outside the germinal centers in the response um, to uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so maybe there could be some of these extra extra follicular B cells. Sure, sure. Um, but I, I, um, we are now getting towards the limits of some of the, my B cell knowledge, so. <laughs> well, and it, but it does, it does say that, you know, the vaccines uh, for many reasons are better because you don't have to worry about a viral protein, you know, reducing T follicular helper cells, you can generate antibodies robustly without this potential. So get the vaccine. And you don't get sick. <laughs> right. And spread it to others. That's right. All right. Gordon writes, hello, I'm a wood carver from Tennessee with no medical background or training, but I did enjoy your recent podcast because I find all of this about coronavirus very interesting. The reason I'm emailing is the topic at the end of the podcast about the man in Hong Kong reinfected but not sick was intriguing because I watched the numbers in Italy on Worldometer all through the height of the infections. If you look at infections today in Italy, the closed cases, 242,000 total, 206,000 survived, 35,000 died. That's 15% of the closed cases died. But what's interesting to me is the active case they have today, 20,000 people infected, only 69 in critical care. Back at the height, If they had 20,000 infected, they would have several hundred or more in critical care, which makes me think that maybe the 20,000 active right now contain a large portion of reinfected people who are not getting seriously ill. Uh, I don't know if it's a large portion. I don't think a large portion of people get reinfected. I think it's pretty small, but I do think um, that uh, the medical establishment has responded. They have you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, they didn't have enough oxygen for everyone. Lots of things like that. They didn't know how to take care of patients, and then they got better at it. That's what Daniel Griffin always says. We're learning how to take care of the patients, and we're saving their lives. So I think that's a big part of it in any outbreak, right? You learn how to deal with the disease. Woodcarver, huh? Cool. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> very cool. And this is, so this this comment on reinfection we were just discussing amongst the four of us before the we started recording about these breakthrough infections at a, I think it was a Yankees game or Yankees players. And so we were discussing that really as we move forward with opening up more of society, we're supposed to be, you know, full capacity at our sports stadiums and, and the athletes are getting routinely tested. You're going to see this pop up more and more because what we probably know is that the vaccine is doing a great job of providing protection against severe disease, but that doesn't mean that the virus can't enter your nose and mouth and replicate a couple times. You then become positive, but 
immediately your antibodies are there to block it from further causing disease. So testing positive just means that the virus has had the ability to replicate a couple of times. It's not going to cause huge problems, but sterilizing immunity is a very high bar to reach. So, yeah. And this yeah. isn't necessarily a SARS-CoV-2 specific thing. That's kind of generally how we think that a lot of this works with vaccines and immunology. It's just that we are not routinely testing you uh, for many of the other vaccine or viruses for which you're vaccinated. Yeah. This is an unusual situation, right? I think the sad part is, though, we still have a... a a decent percentage of our population who is not eligible to get vaccines. Mm-hmm. So I know I need Pfizer to bring 12. that age down to two, one. Well, I got a 10 month old, so <laughs> bring, bring that age down. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, those of us who are now trying to go about our business normally, we have to keep in mind that, you know, individuals you might be interacting with could still have young children that are vulnerable mm-hmm. either with them or at home and they could, they could yep. bring it back. And like you say, you can you can get a little bit and, and your immune system will control it, but it doesn't mean that you couldn't shed a little bit and give it to someone else who is not protected. So the, yeah, the I, idea that eliminating all mask mandates and so forth, you know, for those that are vaccinated where the, you know, we can get into a political discussion here, but there's concern, you know, that individuals won't be honest. And if they're not vaccinated, they, they will not mask. And then they have potential to be spreaders. And then you have potential to, to become positive and then transfer it to someone else who's not protected. Yeah. And I do find it interesting that if, I, I believe that if the roles were switched and that there was a vaccine for all pediatric patients and there was a percentage of pediatric patients that were vaccinated and they had access to it, but for whatever reason, there was no adult vaccine. This would not happen, right? We would not be opening things up. People would still be wearing masks. I do think there's a bit of a bias because adults can be protected and we're like, all oh, the kids will be fine. So I think, it, I think Cindy, your point is, is well taken. Hmm. Cindy, can you take the next one? Sure. Thomas writes, my name is Thomas from Sonoma County, California, right in the middle of the LNU fire. I love your show, especially the video version where I can see you interact and probably lots of my funny faces, right? (laughs) I previously watched many of Dr. Vincent Racaniello's virology lectures. I have an engineering background with no formal biology training. I have read many papers trying to understand the immune system and its practical aspects like antibody testing reliability and vaccine design reliability, but few papers are able to answer specific questions. I have just enough knowledge to be dangerous, don't we all? <laughs> Two questions come up for me, came up for me while watching your episode number 34. Many of the most prominent COVID vaccines appear to be the equivalent to a subunit or a single protein or peptide out of many, vaccine, which would seem to be limited in immune response to the one spike protein. The idea of neutralizing antibodies or blocking ACE2 cell entry is broadly hyped, but how can there be enough antibodies to actually block potentially billions of virus particles and stay ahead of their dramatic production rate? It seems foolish to think it's possible to block every virus entry and then stay ahead of the population. If that fails, it seems that these are just subunit vaccines that could trigger a limited and possibly meager antibody and T cell, all types, response. This may not stir up the most complete overall response, plus may be very susceptible to genetic changes in the few epitopes amino acid sequences. It would seem that a better strategy would be to use a carefully genetically altered full viruses, full array of proteins, plus the neutralizing protein via mRNA, so as to achieve both the cell access blocking and widespread antibody and T cell epitope recognition over all the peptides and broad enough to resist genetic changes. This in turn would seem most likely to establish both the quickest and 
robust future adaptive immune response given all the positive feedback, cytokines, et cetera, signaling back and forth to the innate immune system needed for a robust response and not just blocking or neutralizing. Is there something I'm missing in my simple analysis? My understanding is all HSV subunit vaccines have failed miserably in part for this reason. Could you give your thoughts as I know it's a very complex problem? There's another part to this, but do we want to address this part first? I think he described an immune response, right? <laughs> yes. So, yes. So if we have a live virus, we're going to get all of that. Uh, and I think, you know, from my perspective, we're trying to balance safety and efficacy. And so subunit vaccines are safer because you don't have, even if you have a killed vaccine, there's a potential for to have the failure to inappropriately inactivate it. And then you can have live virus get out. It's very rare, but it's possible. Um, whereas if you have live attenuated virus, those vaccines are pretty effective, but they also run the risk of back mutating or recombining with another strain. And so depending on the virus type, so the subunit vaccines are quite safe and they're reasonably effective, but the limitation is we don't generate as good a T-cell response. That being said, the vaccines that we now developed, these mRNA-based vaccines that are getting into the antigen-presenting cells seem to be able to generate a pretty good T-cell response in addition to the antibody response. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's one difference here is that an mRNA vaccine is not identical to a subunit vaccine um, in terms of how it induces immune responses. Um, I think the other uh, question that he asks is sort of interesting and is something that I didn't think about until I'd really started to understand the spike protein a little bit more, um, which is that the spike protein is a really large protein. It's 1,273 amino acids, um, and it contains many epitopes, not just one. And yep. so even so, with the mRNA encoding the spike, um, you are inducing many antibody responses to individual epitopes, many T cell responses to individual epitopes. And so while you, he talks a little bit about the idea of genetic change altering the epitopes, um, that may be something that can happen with one or two epitopes and not say 50, um, which is more like the number that is pr potentially present. Um, yeah. So I think that you raise a good point. Like each, each antigen or protein can have multiple epitopes on it. And for each epitope, you can generate multiple different antibodies. So, so that would be a polyclonal response to that particular antigen. And so it's sort of a fail safe backup mechanism. If it mutates one amino acid, there should be lots of other parts of that protein that could be recognized by various different antibodies to protect it. Yeah. So, so in some ways, you know, yes, it would be great if we could put another antigen in a vaccine sometime in the future, but spike is pretty good given the number of epitopes that it has. Yeah. Um, and so that's one kind of issue what he talks about. He also mentions the idea of neutralizing antibodies, blocking billions of virus particles. Yeah. And I think that the idea is that those neutralizing antibodies say they're in your nose are not first interacting with billions of virus particles that you're exposed to. Um, you may be exposed to a somewhat smaller number of them um, in the nose. Yeah, I think billions would be what happened if you have an, a naive individual and it progresses to billions. And we have to remember, there's also the innate immune system um, signaling cascades to um, kill infected cells, to secrete you know, toxic chemicals that would also bring down, you know, the, the viral load until the antibodies um, can get there because it, it's not like the day after. Um, <clears throat> but I also wanted to mention that, okay, so the suggestion of let's just encode an mRNA vaccine for all the different proteins in SARS-CoV-2, you know, that especially let's think about nucleocapsid because it has commonalities to other coronaviruses. You could have this idea of this universal coronavirus vaccine, which is being um, tested. <clears throat> but I have to remember that there's not an unlimited capacity for our bodies to generate antibodies in the germinal centers. There's competition for antigen that is picked up by the, you know, by the dendritic cells and the follicular T help helper cells. Um, and so you may not be driving a, a very strong neutralizing antibody response if you're including a peptide that does not have immunogenic regions. And so then you're developing maybe kind of meh antibodies that do okay at neutralizing where you could have taken the 
entire force of, you know, antibody generation to focus on neutralizing epitopes. So I think it's a balance. You don't want to just include peptides that maybe don't drive these neutralizing responses. And as Cindy always says, if you've got too many cells infected, then the T cells and the NK cells can come and kill them. Yeah. yeah. And so you don't have to worry about billions of particles anymore. You prevent them from being made. It's, it's you know, it's more than one thing. Mm-hmm. I have to point out, though, that the, uh, I think one of the inactivated vaccines made in China didn't do so well, despite having yeah, more proteins didn't. than a spike. Now, obviously, it's more complicated than just more proteins, but... Well, yeah. and, and how poorly did it do? I, I mean, I, th- I think I remember like a uh, 40 or 50 percent efficacy. Yeah. And, and that was like the bar before. Right. So our, our bar has has <laughs> moved like it has almost a lot, a lot not, not quite. But I mean, substantially, like w- previous to this, if a vaccine showed 50 percent efficacy, we were like, yeah, that's good. Yes. We're happy. We <laughs> reduced the number of cases by half. That's great. And now we have these, you know, mRNA vaccines that have shown efficacies of above 90 percent that now that bar is going to be hard. Now, the one, before we go on to this next thing, one, the, the one thing I'm always wondering about is, are we going to are we going to now switch to all vaccines being made this way? And hmm. and if we do, I, I'm not sure how many people are going to be willing to put themselves and their children to get these shots multiple times when the um, the the not side effects, but the vaccine reactions are yeah. really they're significant, right? I mean, this yeah, is, I, agree. I think if we had a normal flu season and somebody came out with one of these vaccines and people started having these reactions, people go, nope, I'm done. I'm not getting it. It's the risk isn't that high, but just everybody sort of went, we're in this crisis mode, give me anything. And so everybody's like, yep, yep. Felt terrible for a day or two. It's okay. It's better than the disease. But I wonder whether this is going to stick long-term because I know I might think twice, even, you know, unless they gave me a universal flu vaccine that I knew I wasn't going to need to get it again, then I would my stick my arm in. But I mean, it's pretty brutal. Yeah, We've all be. had it. Yeah. So it's not. Many, yeah. Not many trivial, people have right? a really bad reaction. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. I think a lot of the established vaccines aren't going to change, right? We have some that are working really well, like the DTAP, uh, mm-hmm. Well, the pertussis part of it isn't so good, right? Yeah, well, they're not going to make an mRNA vaccine out of that, but the the other parts are pretty good, and they combine that with polio vaccine uh, and so forth. But I do think for the viruses where it hasn't worked, like herpes and HIV and maybe Mm -hmm. influenza, they may try it, yeah. Yeah, and I know RSV and CMV are the other two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. Okay, well, we still haven't finished Thomas's email. We got on a nice conversation there, but okay. So he had a second part. Many viruses and all pathogens have many surface exposed proteins, each of which have hundreds of potential peptide epitope sites, and some have widely varying strain species epitope variation due to changes to amino acids, yet cause the same disease. How does an antibody test designer choose a specific or few epitopes and an associated few antibody set to find in the blood that has high enough specificity, the right pathogen, sensitivity, low false negative rate, and sufficient blood cells? For example, I have low total IgG and subtypes. For detection, accurate enough to be useful? How good are typical antibody tests, such as in COVID, unless they test for many possible separate antibodies and not cross-react with the cold viruses, as might be done in Western blot with the levels and multiple specific antibodies, for example, 10 or more, can be, quote-unquote, seen individually to allow excellent discretion. Yeah. But even a Western blot can be fooled by sufficiently distant strain or species that results in the same disease. Could you give your thoughts on this difficult problem? I would imagine that there's high throughput methods that these companies use to screen peptides, right? Um, And then you put antibodies on them and you see which ones bind with the highest specificity and lower. Yeah, so I, I think you can bind an entire antigen to a plate or you can bind epitopes to a plate, right? Right. And, and you do this development you know, with control samples um, to make sure that you are actually checking for these false negatives and false positives. 
Yeah, you can do peptide arrays where you, you tile the whole proteome of a virus on a, on a slide, right? And then you just throw sera and you... Now, these are good questions. Well, yeah. yeah. They do. This is stuff, but they did. The, the, the antibody tests we have are really good. Some of them are really good and specific and sensitive. So I think if you're starting out with a brand new virus, you look for the protein that it has the highest um, immunogenic sites that drives the highest amount of antibody responses and start there, right? So spike. Um, yeah. and, and then do what Vincent mentioned. You could take m multiple different lengths um, as a peptide array and test like brand set positive negative samples and then set that threshold. Yeah, I was thinking when, when when HIV was first isolated, right, there was no other virus that we knew of that infected people. So they rapidly could make these kinds of tests without worrying about cross-reactivity, right? But here, right. there's lots of coronaviruses we have to worry about. So it's an interesting right. conundrum, right? <laughs> Good questions, Thomas. Yep. Yeah. And there are there are lots of algorithms that they can use to run a, a protein or amino acid sequence through to try and figure out what what amino acids are surface exposed and which ones are potentially the most immunogenic based on the ability of that sequence to bind to different antibody structures. So Steph, can you take the next one? Yeah, sure. So how do we think we pronounce ragu? Ragu. Ragu, okay. My warm greetings to the immune triad. I'm Ragu from India, an undergraduate pre-final year biotechnology student. I have just been introduced to my immunology coursework and have started listening to the immune podcast. I find immunology very interesting and inquisitive, mostly because I feel there is a certain enigma to the subject. <laughs> I would agree. I have certain doubts regarding MHC molecules and maybe maybe certain thoughts about the MHC molecules, thought you all might be able to help me with it. Every individual has six different possibilities of MHC class one. Will they express all six MHC class one or any one among the six possibilities? Um, isn't that the same question? So, no, all six. <laughs> yeah, they express all six. It's called co-dominant expression. But isn't he asking... Oh, he said, so will they just express all six or just one? Is right, that, right. That's yeah, that's question. Question. they'll express all six. Yes, yes, all six, right. Yep. We could go into codominant expression <laughs> if we want, but we don't have a whole lot of time. Maybe we'll do an MHC episode. <laughs> and MHC is so cool. I mean, it's, it's, so it's cool. very highly polymorphic, and you've got multiple genes that encode, encode the same protein. It's just so weird. Right. Yeah. Usually, you have a one one pro one gene, one protein. And this is multiple genes that encode different versions of the same protein, that do the exact same function but have slightly different sequences. So they combine right. different arrays of peptides. And so the whole idea of codominant expression is that you do express all of the MHC one molecules that you have, so that you have the highest potential peptide binding um, of all those different MHCs. Right. Okay, so number two, since the MHC molecules don't bind to all peptides equally, is there a possibility that any one type among the six of MHC1 can effectively present a type antigen to TC cells compared to the other five? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and what, is, what do we think he means by TC cells? So I think he means uh, CTLs or CD8 T cells. So I think, the, oh, okay. I think his question is... Um, it, you have six or their question, I guess I don't know if it's a he or a she. I think the question is asking about, you have these six MHC class ones on the surface of a particular cell. Um, is one of them going to present a peptide that leads to a better T cell response than others? Or is one of them going to lead to be able to present a peptide from a pathogen while the others aren't? Um, that's a little less, uh, something that happens, uh, although there's there are some great examples in mice, which are inbred, um, of that happening. And some MHCs uh, types actually having the ability to present no peptides um, from those pathogens. I think it's Sendai virus, but I can't remember the mouse strain. <laughs> um, that's cool. I didn't realize that's that. That's cool. Um, so, um, yes, they're ab that's absolutely possible. And, and some of the MHC molecules have a high genetic association with diseases because of the fact that there are certain autoantigens that are presented better by certain MHC molecules. And so, therefore, they have a higher preponderance of the autoimmune disease. And, and actually, the flip side of that is that some 
um, MHC molecules are linked to better prognosis with some infectious diseases because a more protective epitope or an epitope that gives you better T-cell responses Mm -hmm. um, is presented. Great. Okay, number three, if a person newborn is diagnosed with HIV, is it possible to mutate a class of HLA-B um, uh, HLA to HLA-B HLA 27 to decrease the progression of the disease? <laughs> so, no, <laughs> that wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> but you now, if you want to talk about gene editing, and this was a controversy, I don't remember how long, five years ago, you can gene edit the receptor for mm. HIV. Co-recept- and that yeah, was CCR5, right? Yeah. CCR, mm-hmm. yeah. CCR5. And <clears throat> I believe that was tried in twins that yes. were going to be born to an HIV infected mother. And it was probably quite unethical considering we don't really know what the effects of deleting that protein from your genome. Yeah. But um, so, so there's no, a I- lot of controversy on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. So basically, we, we can't gene edit yet. Or yeah. we, we we don't gene edit yet. There have been descriptions that it can be done, although there was controversy around that as well. Yeah. Right. And and just to tie this back to the previous question, um, HLA B27 is you, you know it you you imply that HLA B27 is protective uh, against HIV, which is true. Um, and that's because it presents an epitope that leads to a really good CD8 T cell response. So it's exactly uh, the idea that you're talking about before. Um, but just like HLA-B27 is protective um, against uh, HIV progression, um, you tend to have slower progression. Um, HLA-B27 is also associated with the autoimmune disease ankylosing spondylitis, which is mm. just fun to say. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's sort of pros and cons. Uh, y- you also would have increased, uh, you know, potential for that autoimmune disease. I think it's other autoimmune diseases as well. It seems like they always yeah. come up with HLA B27. I, I just know that that one shows up on one of my slides. Um, and so I always make a point of it. It's <laughs> great. Okay, great. Um, and they and they said, I hope I didn't waste your time. Of course not. Uh, no, we love never. this. Is Good excellent questions. questions. Yep. Magu is a We ma- like straightforward questions. Mag- Magu yeah. in India is a male given name. So oh, okay. typically. Okay. All right, Brienne, you're next. Sure. Bill writes, hello, immune team. I've been listening to TWIV for a few weeks, and I recently listened to Immune Episode 33. I am really enjoying the podcast, and I hope that over the course of listening, I am starting to become a more informed consumer of information about the immunology and virology of COVID-19. As a retired statistician, I am writing this in hopes that I can return the favor and assist the team in helping your listeners become more informed consumers of the statistics and papers. To that end, I'd like to discuss a couple of serious statistical concerns about the paper you reported on in Immune 33. Hmm. My first concern is that when one analyzes a data set with a large number of variables and looks at a lot of relationships among variables, you are likely to get some artifactual findings, i.e. findings that show up as statistically significant, but are in fact due to chance. The first part of this paper reports a large number of findings without, as far as I have been able to determine, any indication that the study should be treated as more appropriate for hypothesis generation to be tested in a later confirmatory study than for drawing firm conclusions. I believe that one of the immune team mentioned this when talking about the paper, but mostly the message got lost in the excitement of the presenters trying to make sense of the immunological results reported in the paper. As an example, the association found between lower immune response and less severe disease is intriguing, but it appears that the low immune response group, immunotype 3, is just 20 cases among the hospitalized patients. And with a small number of cases and a large number of immune variables to choose from, there are many possible ways to find an apparent relationship that is in fact spurious. At a minimum, I would have liked to see some mention in the discussion section of the exploratory nature of the study. The second concern is with the claim that distinct immunotypes have been found. In looking at figures 6D and 6E, which show two versions of the UMAP components 1 and 2 in scatter plots, I see no indication of a breakpoint in the distributions, except for a clear distinction between the active disease group and the others. Similarly, a scatter plot of the first two principal components of the flow cytometry data, figure 2A, show distributions without breakpoints except for the break between active COVID-19 and the RDHD group. Mm -hmm. 
These scatter plots strongly suggest that the immunotypes are not in fact types, i.e. categories, among active COVID-19 cases, but, are, but rather are arbitrary cut points of continuous distributions of characteristics. Similarly, immunotype 3 is simply made up by taking the lower 50% of the distribution on five variables with no indication that this is a natural grouping. There are statistical tests for the existence of gaps in statistical distributions and for natural clusters in multidimensional data, but as far as I could find, this paper reports no such tests. In Immune 33, I would have liked to hear some discussion of these statistical issues. In general, along with the high quality information you present on virology and immunology in your podcasts, I would encourage you to take notice of the strengths and weaknesses of the statistical analysis when you are discussing research papers. Thanks, Bill. So well touche. said, Bill. Yes, yes. Point. <laughs> absolutely. I think I think there's two points here. Um, one is that first of all, I love the, the the phrase "arbitrary cut points of continuous distribution of characteristics." It's so true. I think that what happened, at least for me, is that being raised as an immunologist, I am so used to looking at flow plots, and first of all. I mostly don't do flow cytometry, so you could actually call me not a true immunologist. I mean, I can do it, but it's not my forte. But it bothers me when I look at a plot and I'm like, Why, how did they decide to make that cutoff there? You know, to identify a new subpopulation of a new subpopulation of cells. And it's just like, well, will we draw this little this little circle here and there's some dots in it in this mouse and not in this mouse, so it must be a new population. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I mean, it is, it, it is problematic. It has... It ha that approach has led to some incredible findings in immunology, no doubt. But it is rather arbitrary. <laughs> um, and I think if, if we applied a lot of these statistical tests to look for breakpoints in data that you mentioned, a lot of what is out there would not get published. Because Absolutely. I don't yeah. think there are actual true statistical breakpoints in the data. Yeah, I think that that's very true, especially so this paper, y y you can also contribute this to COVID, right? Oh, People yeah. are publishing, God, yeah. you know, small subsets to get data out there. And that whatever you think about that, we could talk about that too. But I, it, it definitely is the case, especially in COVID. But from a general immunology perspective, and I don't think I'm alone in saying this, I was trained to do statistics in PRISM. T tests. I did actually learn um, R, but in, for a lot of immunologists, I think we we have mice and we have animals and we look at differences between treatment groups and we apply a statistical test in PRISM and we move on. Now going into my postdoc, it's, it's a it was a big change for me because we don't do we we consult with statisticians. Um, we're also working with a lot of human cohort data, so I think it's getting better? And Cindy and Bran, how did you deal with statistics when you were training? Right? Like PRISM. I mean, you just, you plug the data in, you do a T-test or an ANOVA and then boom. So we weirdly <laughs> enough, I actually had taken like quite a bit of statistics as, as an undergraduate. And so okay. I was the statistics person <laughs> <laughs> um, in my uh, PhD lab. Um, and you know, but, statistics people tell me that's so annoying to them because you <laughs> take two classes and they're like, oh, you can do my job. Okay. I get it. Um, and so um, we certainly um, were meeting with statisticians at some points and we're actually thinking about doing some statistics outside of PRISM. But in my mind, um, when I think about how those projects sort of broke down and how projects have broken down throughout my career, it's kind of what you just said about whether we're working with human samples and human cohort studies or whether we're working with mice. Um, yeah. And so it was largely in our either human cohort studies or in our primate vaccine studies where we would meet with the statisticians um, and the and, other ones were- And even with, and with monkeys, I mean, the numbers are even smaller. So mm -hmm. I, I guess a lot of stuff that's published would be maybe more exploratory with these, yep. you know, standards. And Vincent, what do you say about statistics? And I, I, don't, I don't do experiments that require statistics. <laughs> I never have. Um, uh. Well, unfortunately, or for, or fortunately, it depends on how you look at it, a, a lot of things now do require statistics. Because even yeah, if you do a Western blot, yeah. you need to do it four times. And then 
do yeah. well that's you know, easy that's pretty easy densitometry and then do I mean we do black assays and triplicate and we yeah we can mm -hmm. do the yeah. variation that's fine but but what I think what I think that's also worth mentioning is the flip side of it where people get so fixated on the the statistic that they have you know they have a p yes. less than 0. 0.00 or 0. 0.5 so it must be real you know, it doesn't matter if the data are scattered and it doesn't make biological sense. If it says it's, if the program says it's statistically significant, then it must be. And so I think there's also a lot of reliance on that. So I, I, I think that there's. Mm -hmm. I agree. <sighs> That's called so the tyranny we, we, of the p-value, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. So we, we need the statistics, but we also need some sort of knowledge of how to apply that and what makes sense. Because I think in a lot of cases, it doesn't make sense. Sure. So what you're saying is even though a difference is statistically significant, it might not be a real difference. The hypothesis. It might not be biologically significant. might not be biologically significant. Yeah. You got to back off and look at both. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, and but I appreciate whole, the I appreciate yeah. these multidimensional experiments where oh, yeah. everything's all mushed together. Yeah. That's very hard. And But the thing is, um, Bill – we are, I'm, at least I am not qualified to assess that in, in these kinds of papers, you know, and that's the problem. I'm not, you guys, could you have assessed this in this paper? Maybe you could have, no. I don't know. I mean, I think that we all could could put the disclaimer out there, and I think we probably did, that this is 20 patients and the yeah. immense sure. variability in human populations would suggest that that's not going to be a minimum sample size, but that probably would be the extent of it. So... And I know that Cindy, you have said on on many papers where you see a plot, this is like four points, guys. How can you make a new class? You you do that a lot, so I, I think <laughs> we're good. <laughs> yeah, I, and hopefully, people who are doing these types of experiments are consulting with statisticians and are making sure that they are, you know, yeah. able to yeah. answer some of these things. Um, I would. I think that, you know, with the previous paper and maybe they would just have needed to enhance that in the discussion a little bit is you can put, you can definitely do these studies and publish them. You just need to say, like Bill suggested, this is exploratory, you know, this is hypothesis yeah. driving. Yeah. But yeah. if I remember that paper was in a pretty good journal, well, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, they, they won't <laughs> let you be wishy-washy, even if you should be. In that the, was yeah, in instances. science. Yeah, it was in science. Yeah, I, 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 I get the feeling that they they take out the wishy washy statements and force you to be quite direct. Yeah. They want those in clicks. a lot of these. Well, anyway, it's, uh, the point is taken, Bill, for sure, and yeah. um, we'll do our best. Should we do? Do one we want more one, short one one more? Yeah, this one's do, do nice one and more. relates to yeah. Brian. Uh, this is from Tricia. Dear Vincent, Stephanie, Cynthia, and Brianne, I'm a new immune listener and plan to continue to tune in as part of my prep to teach immunology next year. It's been a while. I'm rusty. In episode 39, your discussion of the cost of publishing and the focus on high-impact journals for tenure and promotion caught my attention. My institution chose a path you did not discuss. Granted, I work at a small college, so our publication pressures are different than R1 institutions, and maybe this would never work elsewhere. But several years ago, we voted as a faculty to publish in open access journals whenever possible. In order to support this, the college established a fund to help us pay for the additional costs associated with publishing in open access journals. It became an institutional priority with full support of the faculty and monetar monetary support of the administration. And while we're still excited if a colleague publishes in science or nature, that is not our focus. It's a refreshing change. Thank you for all you do. I'm looking forward to future episodes. And Tricia is a professor and chair of biology at Allegheny College. Awesome. I, that's a good approach. I like that, that you get support from your school. Because I can tell you right now, my school wouldn't do that for us. <laughs> we do. Yeah, I would love there, it. <laughs> there are funds to assist with open access if a faculty member does not have the funds available. Nice. Is enough. that a college a department or a unit, like what level? University. Oh, it's university level. Okay. It, they, they're not saying preferentially publish open access, but they're, if you choose to publish open access, there is a pot of money for those individuals who don't have, you know, the, the money to cover it otherwise. Huh. 
That's but nice. I think some in some cases it's depending on the journal, it's getting almost it's not <laughs> Some journals, it's very expensive to publish. And so open access is actually less expensive. Hmm. Um, it depends on the journal. Yeah. I mean, I've seen some, I, I, I've seen some discussions of some astronomical numbers for, for those top three journals. I don't know if you guys saw that, like upwards of like five, ten thousand yeah. dollars Oh, yeah. I saw like paper. Nature Communications was, or Cell Reports. I don't remember. One of the two was like 9,000. It's nine, insane, eight. right? It's insane. It's insane because the, the costs are out of control. They're not all going to publishing your paper. They have a whole staff of people, right, mm -hmm. that they're paying for. You don't need that if you're just going to put – I mean, you don't need a paper journal. You don't need all the things that go – you don't need all those little articles up front that tell you what this means, you know. <laughs> well, I think wor worse than that, for those, for those who are listening who are not in academia, what you might not understand <laughs> is that – we write grants to get money to do the research, and then we need to publish papers. So then we have to to pay to publish the papers, <laughs> and then we have to pay to get the subscription to read the journal in right. which the paper is published. And we have to donate our time for free to review the papers that are submitted to those journals. And all the money that Cindy just <laughs> mentioned, all of that is taxpayer-funded money. Unless, Correct. right. I mean, the majority, right, is going to be government. Right. Funded. So we get money from the government to pay a journal <laughs> to assign us to review the, the research for free and then to publish it yeah. in that journal. And and who, who gets the money? Well, El, the it's biggest the, the publisher is El Sevier, who makes billions and billions of dollars on That's publishing crazy. our work, which, as you say— we have to pay to publish. We review for free for them, and it's funded by taxpayer money. Does it sound perverse? It sounds really like a big old Ponzi scheme, right? Like it's just, <laughs> it's crazy when you when you really break it down. Needs some revising. Yeah. Anyway, but, yeah. Go ahead, Steph. You were going to say something. Oh, I was going to say, but it, it is perverse, and also because as as trainees, I mean, the model to get those coveted you know, academic prom you know, promotions, yeah, but positions is to publish in um, journals that are in that publishers. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I, crazy. it's, you need to publish for sure, but to get there is crazy. I know. And so that's why this institution, you know, has a different approach. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. It's good. But uh, yeah, many people have discussed this whole issue over and over. We've done it on TWIV. You know, it's a problem. It has mm -hmm. to get fixed. I don't know when it will. Yeah, I don't know. I think there was an effort, correct, for the California syst university systems to not subscribe mm -hmm. to, to uh, but I don't know, did they cave? I don't remember the end result yeah, of I that. I think they, they probably they cut did, a deal. They probably cut yeah. some kind of deal. They always do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I sort of look at it as this, this bean counting is somewhat a lazy way to determine somebody's impact. Yes. It's, you know, Agreed. you don't have to actually read the work and think about it and talk to people oh, totally. and ask what kind of, you know, how, how does their research compare to other research? You just say, okay, somebody else vetted it and it went there. So that must mean it's really good. Yeah, this is that, this that is that doesn't flawed. necessarily mean that's that's it really is. bad. Yeah, because uh, the journals have their own agenda for publishing, right? And it's which not which is in contrast to what our agenda yeah, is. Exactly. Anyway, yeah. uh, that's uh, our email episode. Um, you can find all the text at microbe.tv slash immune if you want to send us an email and have it read and discussed by us, chatted. <laughs> immune at microbe.tv we'd love to hear from you for sure oh, yeah. and if you like what we do consider supporting us microbe.tv slash contribute Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University Cindy Leifer on Twitter thanks Cindy thank you this was fun Steph Langle's at Duke University Stephanie Langle on Twitter thanks Steph thank you Brian Barker's at Drew University Bioprof Barker on Twitter thanks Brianne Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. <laughs>